Son kapanış oturumuna hoş geldiniz. Ee, e, birazdan Cecilia Vakajon gelecek e, ve Kent 95 dünyada neler yapıyor, nasıl e, kentte 95 santimden hangi şehirlerde bakıyoruz, karar vericileri bu yönde etkiliyoruz, e, iyi örneklerden bahsedecek. E, Cecilia ile yaklaşık 3 senedir birlikte çalışıyoruz. E, kendimizi çok şanslı hissediyoruz. Bundan önce Cecilia Ekvator'da dört bakanlığı koordine eden e, koordinatör bakan olarak çalışıyordu. Şimdi belki de ilk defa o dört bakanlığın ismini tam ve doğru olarak sayacağım. E, sağlık, eğitim, e, barınma ve e, spor, sosyal gelişme. E, so, spor, sosyal gelişme beraber geldi. E, Fikret Bey de yorum yaptı. E, dolayısıyla bu dört bakanlığı koordine eden bakan olarak çalışıyordu. E, son üç senede bizimle program direktörü olarak e, çalışıyor. E, birazdan onu dinleyeceğiz. E, yorum yapmak üzere de Fikret Top söz gelecek. E, tanıyanlar tanır ama tanımayanlar için çok hızlıca kendisi Türkiye'de ilk kez e, kurulan Yerel Yönetim Bakanlığı'nın ilk e, müsteşarı. E, Marmara Belediyeler Birliği'nin kurucu genel sekreteri ve bizim aramızdaki e, tabiriyle e, yorulmaz bir e, iyimser. E, üç senedir birlikte çalışıyoruz onunla da. E, çok şey borçluyuz. E, i̇kisine öncelikle teşekkür ederim katkıları için. İstanbul 95'in buraya gelmesinde ikisinin de önemli e, katkıları var. Buyurun sahne sizin. Önce Cecilia konuşacak. Sonra Fikret Bey e, soru soracak, yanıtlayacak sanırım. Cecilia. Well, good evening. It's a privilege to be here and thank you for the Kadir Has University. It's a privilege to be in Istanbul and for me to be always in academia is uh, one of my best uh, moments because I get to share with different views and different people what I know, but I, of course to listen new ideas is always in reaching for what we do. Um, thank you, Yit, for that presentation, and I'm, I'm going to try to do my presentation, do my best to share some of the practices that we've learned so far about Urban 95. But I would first want to tell you a little bit why the Bernard Van Dier Foundation decided to work with young children. And I do want to start talking about babies, because I've heard a lot about, and in our previous presentation, all of our speakers were talking about children. But we do want to concentrate in the earliest stages of life. So we're talking about babies and toddlers. And I, I want to tell you a little bit why we decided to work in this very specific stage of life. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a real picture of brains. And uh, this is what happens in the brain of uh, a young baby. It's, uh, it usually happens on the two first years of life. Uh, and the picture on the left would be the, the brain of a stunted children who hasn't been able to be part of a stimulated environment. And the picture on your right would be the picture of a brain of a baby that has been able to access to a nurturing care environment, that has been able to access to, of course, a good nutrition, and who has been able to access to something that I believe it's probably one of the most important things which is responsive care. And this is a very new concept that many of the early childhood development communities probably speaking about. And it has to do with this contact with other humans. And uh, when I was listening to our previous speakers, I listened a lot about the fact of how important it is to be in contact with nature. Uh, but I do want to highlight the fact that I believe it's important to be in contact with other humans. And that's also part of our environment, and that's also part of nature. And unfortunately, what we see it's happening in many of our cities is that we get less and less responsive contact with other humans surrounding our lives. And this has to do, in fact, part because of technology, and many times we're more concentrated on what's happening through social networks. I actually can see some people connected to social networks right now which is normal, that's what usually happens in this kind of uh, presentation. But I, I think uh, this should also make us think, are we really getting in touch? Are we really connecting to others? And when I'm thinking about connections, I'm thinking about the connections our brain is doing right now. But think about the connections that the brain of a healthy baby is doing every second. Do any of you know how many connections the brain of a baby does every second? 
I think probably Yeet mentioned it, but I'm not sure if any of you recall that. Any thoughts on that? Nobody picked that up? So a baby makes one million connections every second. Imagine what one million connection actually represents in the brain of everyone. The bad news is that after the teenager's life, the period of life, we start making less and less connections. So all, everyone in this room is making less and less connections. This doesn't mean that we're not making connections. It just means that the first years of life is the period that we need to take advantage in order to make sure that these connections are positive connections and that we can reassure a good beginning of life for every baby, for every toddler, that we're trying to raise in these amazing cities like Istanbul, but any other city around the world. And that's the challenge that the Bernard Van Dier Foundation has taken. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting challenge. This is part of the reason that I accepted this work, because I thought we need to work in cities. So I, as uh, Yid mentioned, I worked as a, I, I was a, I'm a former minister of social development. And for me, one of the challenges of working as a minister is that you don't get to solve the local problems. You don't get to see what's really happening in the field. You don't get to see... So everybody speaks on how important it is to work across sectors, but when you're working at a local level, you actually need to put all the sectors together. And that's what we're trying to do through the cities. Um, the one other thing I want to say about uh, social policy, I'm not an urban planner, I'm not an urban expert. I do have a lot of experience in social policies and social work, that's my field of work. But the one thing I want to say is that for many years, I think most countries in the world have been focusing on survival issues. Okay? If you see the Millennium Development Goals, we're all about making uh, babies and, and mothers and families survive and overcome different kinds of illnesses. I think that in this stage, of course, we still have many countries around the world that have important challenges that have to do with survival issues. But I think nowadays, we need to think about how we can make people's lives thrive. And we need to think about how we can meet, make children thrive. And this is the big difference. And Turkey, let's take just the example of Turkey. I think Turkey is one of the countries that has the best in social indicators, for example, on decreasing mortality, uh, maternal mortality and infant mortality. So Turkey is one of the countries that did best on accomplishing the Millennium Goals. So you're doing pretty well on survival issues. You, you're doing pretty well in access to basic needs. Pretty much every Turkish has access to electricity, to uh, even if it's not always potable water, at least to water. And this makes a huge difference for most uh, many countries on, on the developing world. And I want to say this because I think this is the main reason that pushes us to think about what can we do at a city level? Is there anything that we can do different at a city level in order to promote social equity? Is there anything that we can do at a city level that can actually promote a thriving life for young children? Is there anything that we can do different that can actually allow children to have a real, full development on their potential? Okay? Um, and when we're talking about young children, we're also talking about pregnant women. And I like to speak, and I would like to share with you a bunch of different pictures, just because I think that sometimes one picture can speak more than a thousand words. And I really like this picture, uh, because you're seeing a pregnant woman, she's completely relaxed. She's actually enjoying a public space. So she's enjoying a beautiful view, she's probably just like by herself because she needs to be by herself, but she's in contact with this beautiful space. Uh, this would actually remind me of any uh, nice corner in Istanbul as well, just like looking at the, uh, either at the Bosphorus or any other of the beautiful views that the city has. But not every pregnant woman has access to this. And, and this is what we're trying to change. So I'm, I'm just gonna put some of the challenges that we are trying to face through Urban 95. And then I'm, I'm happy to share some of the experiences that we have so far. And then I'm probably going to share with you some of the things that if I were the mayor of Istanbul or any other city in the world, I would like to promote and do. Uh, this is another picture that uh, talks by, by itself. And, uh, and here this uh, picture clearly shows something that I was talking about before, which is responsive caregiving. 
And uh, one of the things that we, we, we heard before as well was how important it is to enjoy public space, to enjoy playgrounds. But I would say it's not only that. What we're trying to emphasize and what we're trying to enforce through Urban 95 also has to do with is there any way that we can use public space in order to improve the interactions between caregivers and children and young children? Is there any way that we can promote responsive caregiving? So it's not just like taking kids to play, it's also about creating different situations where we can interact between caregivers and young children. And I'm using the word caregivers because not every children in the world has access to have all the time they want with their parents. Many times we're talking about different caregivers, many times we're talking about grandparents, many times we're talking about older siblings, many times we're talking about third caregivers that spend more time than their own parents with these children. But what we are sure, and there's a lot of evidence and there's a lot of science confirming this, is that responsive caregiving, responsive interactions between young children and adults creates this um, thriving uh, development of the brain. So this is what we need to emphasize about. These are some examples of different pictures um, and uh, I must say that we took different pictures and it's not only examples of the Netherlands and Copenhagen but they're actually examples also coming from the south so the pictures on your right are pictures from Bogota and uh, Sao Paulo which are also very large cities in South America which very similar challenges as uh, probably Istanbul might have uh, and what I'm trying to highlight in these pictures it's uh, how happy the society looks and how enjoyable a public space can actually be, okay? And just think about this because we're going to be developing these ideas in the following slides. Then I'm choosing these different pictures because this is the reality that we face in many in the cities that we're currently working. So the picture on your left is a picture of one of uh, Brazil's favelas that we currently work in. Uh, so in Brazil, we're mainly working in Sao Paulo, which is also a very large city, very similar to Istanbul's population. It's, I think uh, Sao Paulo is like 15 million inhabitants. Um, and uh, one of the challenges in the favelas, and it's, it always looks like this, like, like you have like this endless, very steep stairs. And, and this is the public space that favelas have. And uh, when I was listening before, of course, we would love most people to have access to green spaces, and that would be our main priority. But this is really not the case in many cities around the world. They, they hardly have any public space. But they do have a, a public space, and they do spend a lot of time in this public space. And I, I saw the same thing in Istanbul, just uh, on, on the different times I've been here. There's a lot of the life of Istanbul that's still happening on the street and you can have coffee on the street and you can have different interactions on the street. So sometimes I'm wondering, is it a matter, as Selva was mentioning, do we need to have like, or to enforce different kind of guidelines that allows us to have like more healthy experiences in, in this uh, space of streets? Or uh, is there anything we can do in order to, to really make this public space a space that can promote uh, a, a good interaction among adults and young children. What can we do in this public space that we can reassure a better living for everyone, not for young children? Because I, I do agree that whatever is good for a good child is going to be good for the other stages in life. But in our case, we really focus on young children because we think if, if we affect their lives, then this will have a, a higher impact in the future. Um, one of the issues there is not only like the physical, um, how difficult it might be from a physical point of view to go up the stairs for, um, I don't know, a thousand steps, but I think one of the challenges that we face, especially for example in Brazil, has to do with security issues. And, and you know that security also has to do with the perception. So it, it's not only the fact that it's actually a safe and secure place, but it's sometimes the perception of people. And we've realized, especially working with many different caregivers, that one of the perceptions of security in these spaces is related, for example, with the uh, light. So very dark places usually have a bad perception of security. People don't feel safe if it's dark. People don't feel safe if it's dirty. People don't feel safe if it's too gray. 
So sometimes just changing the gray into colors or changing a very dark space into a more light uh, or full of light space or changing this space into a more playful space can also change the perception of the citizens who are constantly taking the stairs as their only way to their homes. On your right, you have two different pic pictures. The, the first one has to do with uh, just like trying to explain the, the problems and the challenges that we have in living in very densified cities. And the second one has to do with the, the fact that we were talking before. We do have many children playing on the streets, living on the streets, and growing on the streets. And which are some of the challenges that we have in dealing what we can do in the streets? Is there anything we can do in the streets differently? And uh, we have our colleague from NACTO here, and we're building a, a street guides for kids with NACTO. And one, for me, one of the, uh, my favorite things uh, that I've re learned recently has to do with, if you think about a city, usually the streets is the largest public space that we have in any city. But when, if you ask anybody to define what is a, a, a street, usually people think about cars. We don't think about streets as a public space where we can include other people, where we can include a healthy living for everyone. Uh, so I think this is something that we got to keep in mind, and this is something that we're looking a lot when we're thinking about public space and when we're thinking about mobility. So now let's go back to our concept of Urban 95, and I, I think you've probably heard a lot about why Urban 95, but I, I do want to repeat why Urban 95. So when you think uh, about a 95 uh, centimeters perspective, this means that you're seeing the world from this size. And this makes a complete difference when, when you're wandering around a city, and it gives you a complete different perspective. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, videos from that size, and uh, just to share some ideas with you, um, I was impressed, for example, how the food industry uh, already discovered this way along, because on many of the films that we've seen, a lot of the processed food and a lot of the junk food is located at that uh, height. Okay, so maybe the food industry already thought about this many uh, a long time ago, because if you go around any supermarket or if you go around, if you walk around any street, you're going to see that a lot of the publicity of either chocolates or um, drink, different kinds of drinks, not to mention any specific brand, uh, but uh, are located at that height. Uh, so I think this, this is a very important thing to share with you. This is the main reason that we chose 95 centimeters, because this is the height of a healthy three-year-old child. Uh, so which are the main things that we're seeing in our approach of Urban 95? As I've mentioned, uh, the first idea that we've been developing in the, in the different uh, interventions that we have around the world have to do with public space, and I'll share with you some of the experiences that we have around public space. As you see here, we're talking about green public space. Ideally, we do want public space to be as green as possible, but as I was mentioning before, in many of the cities that we're currently working, this is not the case. In many cities in India, it's hard to find green spaces. In many of the cities that we're currently working, in Brazil, in Peru, it's actually difficult to find a green public space. Um, even in Bogota, and, uh, and Tim was, uh, was talking about Bogota, and I think we've had uh, very interesting experiences of, of, uh, of work in Bogota, but I must say that when you go to Bogota, to some of these uh, um, slums in, in Bogota, it's, it's very difficult to find green public space. Uh, the second issue or component that we look into carefully in Urban 95 has to do with mobility. And when we're thinking about mobility, I, I want to say that one of the things that we're trying to find out is our urban planners, our leaders, thinking about how easy it is to transit in any city around the world. Are, are we thinking how far it takes us to, to reach different services, and especially when somebody is trying to raise a kid? How long does it take me to get to the health center? How long does it take me to get to the daycare center? How long does it take me to, to go to the playground? And, and this can become like a difficult issue when you're thinking about mobility in families with young children. It's, it's so difficult to move around the city that what many caregivers decide is to stay indoors because it's just exhausting to go outside and it's just very difficult to go outside. 
The third thing has to do with parenting support, and I'm also going to be sharing uh, some ideas with you, but when we're talking about parenting support and uh, um, the previous uh, speakers talked about play, and for us play is one specific behavior, but we think there are many other specific behaviors that we can support parents do better. So one is play, so we can uh, just coach parents on different ways so they can play and interact more uh, in a more positive way with their children. Uh, but there are other behaviors such as storytelling, uh, such as singing, that are also very important. Uh, but we also have other types of behaviors that we're trying to promote through our parenting programs that have to do with breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding until six months. Uh, no matter how many efforts we've done around breastfeeding, the, the indicators on breastfeeding around the world are still decreasing, they're not increasing, and the food industry that's selling powder milk is definitely increasing in all countries. Okay, so this is also something that we need to take into account, and this has to do with one specific behavior. Uh, another kind of behavior that we're trying to promote has to do with uh, storytelling, and, and this, um, uh, this has been really interesting because uh, in, in many countries that we work, uh, such as Ivory Coast, uh, one of the challenges that we have is that a very large percentage of the population is illiterate. So when you tell them, oh, uh, we want to promote storytelling, and, and you're talking to some of the uh, teachers or health workers that we work with, they're, they're like, oh no, we cannot do storytelling because all of our parents are, are mostly illiterate. And this is completely wrong, because storytelling doesn't have to do with telling the story or reading the story, but actually recuperating a lot of the identity just by telling stories, and telling stories about daily life. Uh, so this is a very important behavior that we're also working on our parenting programs. And uh, finally, the, our last component uh, that uh, is, um, for me, one of the key components in order to be able to have uh, good policies and in order to monitor and evaluate the impact of, uh, of all of our interventions has to do with uh, data-driven decisions and making decisions through the analysis of data. Let's uh, see some of the examples. Um, maybe the very first thing I would like to share with you about uh, some of the, um, I, I don't want to say successful experiences, but what we see is working around the, uh, around the world in the, the different cities that we're working, is uh, supporting leaders who make the difference. And, and we were just talking about uh, how the political decisions in any city, at the end of the day, is what really defines the pathway to make social change. And, and this is definitely true, and we've seen it in every city that we work in. If we're able to convince a mayor, if we're able to convince uh, the urban planner in the city, if we're able to convince the health worker, if we're able to convince the nurse, on how any of these components affects the life of young children and their families, this political will is what makes the difference in order to start a successful program. So I do want to emphasize in this because many times we don't see the importance of doing politics and when I'm saying doing politics, I'm talking in the most positive way of just saying we do need to work with leaders in order to define the political way and the pathway to change many of the unequal situations around different cities in the world. And uh, when we're working about, with leaders, we're talking about different kinds of leaders. We're talking about um, public leaders, meaning people working at the municipal level. We're also talking about academic lead leaders, who is developing new knowledge, who is developing new science, who is developing new evidence towards specific topics. Uh, that's why we are probably here today, because we do feel that academic leaders make the difference in any society. But this also creates a lot of tensions between the academic leaders and who are implementing the different programs. And, and we have to be aware of that, right? Uh, usually a mayor has four years to run a program and they're very interested about having quick wins, while academia wants to have the, the evidence in order to showcase what's happening at the, at the local level. So it's very difficult sometimes to overcome those tensions because the interest and, and the outcome might be different. Uh, but uh, we believe and we've seen that if we can create like a, a good team of work together, this usually works because you're getting 
evidence and then you're implementing immediately and you're trying to get the evidence through the implementation. And this usually works with very positive results. Uh, the other kind of leaders that we believe it's also important to uh, gather are business leaders and, and this is, is always a challenge because sometimes uh, we believe that there are different in interests that might be um, might not always match our own interests from the social perspective, but I think that it's important to see that we need to work with all different kinds of stakeholders and that the business sector definitely has a key role in developing a city, in developing different forces inside a city. Um, and finally, the, the media leaders are also very important. Who is talking about what's happening at a city level? Who's communicating about what's happening in a city level? What's happening with the social networks? Are we able to communicate what's happening with the social networks? So for us, being able to talk with all this thought leadership, it's very important. It's really key, it's very strategic, and this is, in, in, in many ways, what can reassure a successful implementation of any kind of program, of any kind of policy. Especially if you're thinking about scaling programs, if you're thinking about having impact at a, at a larger level. Um, I just wanted to share with you a couple of, uh, of pictures showing uh, some experiences. This is a picture from Greece and uh, this is, uh, we, we ran um, a global challenge two years ago when we were just starting with Urban 95. So we got different small projects around the world trying to, to tell us what they thought about Urban 95 and some practical ideas that they could execute in any, of, in, in any city around the world. And this is one, uh, one specific experience about, uh, it, that happened in Greece and I, I wanted to show this picture because I, I think it's also important to think about the public space being a very um, playful space, a very creative space and also a space where you can actually promote lots of uh, arts and interaction, not necessarily with the direct caregiver. If, if you see here, the, the people that are basically coaching and, and, and, and cheering the kid there is not necessarily a direct caregiver. It's probably somebody who's um, organizing the play in the public space. Uh, but we've seen many different experiences, not only in Greece, but in, in many of the other cities that we work in, and especially in, in some of the key cities such as Pura, Sao Paulo, where uh, this organized place has a lot of impact because usually Young kids don't always have a caregiver that can stimulate that playing, so municipalities have been engaging in also promoting this kind of uh, communitarian uh, play and share, and, and this has been very positive. Uh, this, uh, actually, the, the picture on, on your left is uh, in Istanbul, and, and this is part of our work here, so we promoted family picnics, right, Yi? And, uh, and uh, there it was also very interesting because uh, the municipalities got engaged into promoting family picnics that, uh, as far as I understand, it's, it's also very common in Turkish culture. And, but these picnics were run during uh, Mother's Day and, and the, the fun part of it is that the key message there was all these different behaviors that we could promote with parents of young children. And we got lots of babies and lots of young children just expressing and sharing in a public space with other parents, which is also very important in that stage of life. Uh, we have many different examples of how important, especially for women, is to have peer groups that understand what they're going through. Uh, so uh, one of the other issues that we're um, doing some research on has to do with maternal depression. And um, we've realized that a lot of the maternal depression also has to do because of the fact of women feeling isolated. Isolated from their connections with other people, isolated with the fact that they don't feel they have anybody that can understand what they're going through. Uh, and there are many cities that are now promoting um, peer groups of motherhood and it's been very successful just to, to share the stressful moment of of at least the, the very, at least the, the first six months, which are usually the most stressful for most women who have uh, small babies. And the picture on your right is a picture from Israel, and there we've also been promoting 
uh, different spaces uh, where family can interact. And, and basically, again, what I'm trying to say, all of these activities have been hosted by the municipalities. In, in the case of Israel, we've been working with Tel Aviv. And uh, they're also very engaged in, prom uh, in promoting a different use of public space. So Tel Aviv is, is, for example, a city that has a lot of public space, but not necessarily has been focused on young children. So the, the idea there has been, how, is there anything that we can do different in order to adapt some spaces in the city that can actually promote more interactions between caregivers and young children? And, and there are many good examples. This is just a picture, but there are many good examples of what's happening there as well. Um, these two pictures are uh, from South America again, and uh, I, we, you're going to see that I do talk a lot about South America, first of all, because of course I'm from South America, so I always like giving examples from my region of the world. But I also want to say that uh, what has happened in, in, in South America is that we have mega cities. So the cities in South America were probably the cities that were, grew at the fastest rate around the world. And, but there are many things that we cannot really change in South America because it's already there. But we, of course, can improve many of the, of the urban spaces just by understanding better the dynamics and the context of the cities. Uh, and I, I personally think that, of course, when we hear uh, or, or we go to Copenhagen or to Amsterdam or to Rotterdam that are very positive experiences of how you can promote public life through public space, Sometimes it, it, it becomes a bit challenging because you say, how can I become a Copenhagen if I have such a different reality? I personally believe that there are many tools that have been developed in different parts of the world, not only Cop Copenhagen or Amsterdam or Rotterdam, but I think there are many practical tools there that we can also use in, in some of, of, of uh, our cities. And, and we're trying that, we're actually sharing some of the knowledge that we've had, for example, to measure just to give you an example, we, we found like the, the Geld Institute from, from Denmark. They have a very interesting tool in order to measure the use of, of public space and how you can measure uh, with specific indicators the use of public space. And this specific tool has been adapted both in Bogota and Sao Paulo and it's being used right now. And uh, I think that's a good example of, of just uh, sharing with you positive experiences and how you can use some of these tools, adapt them and use them for the scope of your own city, of your own challenges in, in your own city. Uh, but I think there, there are lots of efforts that have already been done that can easily be adapted to your own context. Um, now that I see Simon, I, I also think of uh, very positive experiences of what's happening in Tirana. And I think uh, Tirana, Albania is, is also a very interesting city to, to work on this issue, and especially on mobility issues, because uh, Tirana has almost as many cars as inhabitants. <laughs> and, uh, and there, I think that, for example, the political will of the mayor is basically really transforming the city. And uh, so again, one example of how important sometimes having the political will behind many of this programs and projects and policies is very important in order to start implementing. Uh, the picture on the right is from Bogota. This is a, a very, one of the, it, this, it was considered to be one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Bogota. So when, uh, when we started uh, telling people that we were going to be working in Ciudad Bolivar, everybody, uh, the first thing I, I got as a comment was like, don't go to Ciudad Bolivar by yourself. It's very dangerous. But again, uh, security and safety is, is uh, for me, or from my point of view, many times is also a matter of perception. I've been to Ciudad Bolivar many times, but as far as you can go with some of your peer uh, people working in the community, I feel very safe. What I want to highlight about Ciudad Bolivar, as you see there, what they did is they, they, they took arts as one of their main components of just uh, creating a public space that could be a, lo a lot more colorful. And uh, they've done a lot of these murals around the, the neighborhood. And if you see there, what they've marked is just in order to remind everyone about the importance of Urban 95, all of the murals have some kind of symbol that symbolizes the height of 95 centimeters. So those little twins are uh, three years old and they're almost 95 centimeters. Uh, but it's full of different murals, it's full of different colors. And this has created a different perspective of, of, of the city. 
And what I want to say about Bogota, which it, for me is one of the most important components, is participation. And uh, what I think has been very successful about Bogota and what actually made uh, Mayor Peñalosa make the decision that he wants to replicate this program in 40 different neighborhoods uh, around Bogota has to do with the fact that he has seen the engagement of the community. So basically the community took over, so they, they, they wanted to reform the, the way that they ne they, their neighborhood was looking like, and of course what the mayor did is support them with different technical advice on different things. And um, one of the things that he did uh, is um, they, they, they organized different stakeholders from the community and they tried to identify which were some of the dangerous crossings around uh, Ciudad Bolivar, which is this very specific neighborhood. And when I, they had identified these very dangerous crossings, what they did is, okay, we need to do something so we can alert everyone on how dangerous these crossings are. So they started painting all of the dangerous crossings in the neighborhood. And of course, uh, they started with all this debate internally. This is not normal uh, uh, signals for crossings in Bogota. How can you do that? Where are the zebra lines? This is not the normal sim symbols that we need to use for this. And, and what has brought upon all this participation from the neighborhood is to establish new guidelines on how they can change this, uh, the, the way they, they perceive these different um, symbols on the streets. Because it could also become very dangerous to just like start painting all the different streets and start saying all of these places are dangerous, but then you kind of also can create like a different perception of what's happening on, on the streets. But what I think was very positive about Bogota's experience, first, the participation and engagement of the community and the people in, in the neighborhood. And I'm not talking just about caregivers, I'm talking about different stakeholders in the neighborhood that just realize how important it is to do something different, to identify which were the public spaces that become dangerous spaces for their families. And, and they also uh, did many other activities that were like very low cost and high impact. To give you an example, they started making these pop-up parks and, uh, and you'll see that as one of our key ideas in our Urban 95 kit book. Um, but in, the, in Bogota, they also started taking these pop-up parks, which are basically boxes with different kind of games, including popular games that they play in Bogota. And what they do is they take these boxes to different parts of the neighborhood and they create a dynamic that they create a, an inclusive public space where children and families gather and play. And, and this has also been a very effective uh, policy that's currently working in Bogota and that the mayor is now willing to scale. Um, this is an example of uh, Bangladesh and this also has to do with uh, one of our experiences with the Urban 95 Challenge. And, and here we go to our second component that has to do with mobility. And uh, there are many experiences around the world uh, about different guidelines and policies that are working in the mobility issues. In this case, what they've done is they, they've decided to create specific places where children can feel safe in, uh, in public transport. Um, there's always a lot of questioning around mobility and these issues. And, uh, I've been through this debate uh, in many different cities, for example, in India and Mexico, they have specific wagons for women. And this has created a huge debate for many different mobility advocators, uh, just because uh, in reality, you're not solving the problem, you're not changing the behavior. But on the other hand, you're protecting women, which is the main concern right now. Uh, so I, I think there, there's still a lot of work to do on this mobility policies and guidelines, but I think that the fact that there are things happening right now tells us that there's a need to do something. And uh, I don't know if that's the case in, in Turkey. We haven't worked on mobility issues specifically in Turkey, but I, I, I would challenge everyone here to start thinking about what to do with mobility in Turkey, because I, I definitely think this is a key issue when you're thinking about the development of the city and the development of Urban 95 as, as a key idea. 
Um, this is part of what Nestle was explaining before. This is our, our parenting program. So actually, we have some of our home visitors in, in this uh, conference as well. We're very happy to have you here. And um, what I like about this uh, parenting program in Turkey specifically is uh, that what we're doing is uh, home visiting programs. This is based on many different programs around the world. There is a, a specific methodology that has shown a lot of evidence. It was proven in Jamaica that if you're able to coach parents from a very early stage when babies are born, uh, the development of a baby can solve many different problems. In the case of Jamaica, for example, they, they were able to reduce stunting, they were able to uh, reduce violence, they were able to increase breastfeeding. So there's a lot of evidence on how effective parenting programs can be around the world. I wanted to point out that this is the home visiting program that we are running in four different municipalities in, in Istanbul. But uh, we also have a, a very similar program in Brazil, which is based on a cash transfer program. So Brazil has like 9 million families that receive cash transfers every month. Uh, and uh, Crianza Feliz is a specific program that combined the, the cash transfer with a home visiting program. Um, of course, Brazil has many different experiences of home visiting programs. This is one program that is working through the Ministry of Social Development, but basically what's allowing it's uh, the families that get a cash transfer, they're not only getting money, which probably doesn't really solve many of the stress related to poverty, but they're also getting some counseling and some coaching for parents to have different ideas on how to raise better their children. And what's interesting about most home visiting programs is not only the home visiting program that addresses children's needs, but many times when you visit a family, you have many different uh, problems that that family under a situation of stress, under poverty, is living. And I, I'm sure that even if, if we would ask some of our home visitors uh, what has happened in, in their visits, I'm sure that they can tell us stories about when you visit a family, sometimes you find a problem related to violence or related to drug addiction or related to maternal depression or related to some other kind of problem. So the importance of doing a home visit is that you can refer to a different service. And, and this has been very successful in many different parenting programs. You might be familiar with this program as well, and this has to do with data. Uh, I'm a, a particular fan of having indicators and having access to data and having data being as democratic as possible because I think that having access to good indicators allows you to make good decisions. And this has to do at a city level, if you're talking to urban planners, if you're talking to a mayor, if a mayor is able to be aware of what's happening in, in, in his or her city, he's able to make better decisions. And, and part of what we were doing in, in Turkey and trying to do is give maps that could locate where are the children, because many times we know how many children we have in our district or we know how many children we have in our neighborhood, but we don't know exactly where our children or our poorest children or the families that might be facing more problems, where are they living? So this is the kind of maps that we've worked in, in Istanbul. It's, it's been interesting to see the reaction of many policymakers on understanding how to use this information. We were yesterday in Bello Luz uh, municipality and I, and I thought it was really interesting because we met the deputy mayor and uh, we were talking about the, the playgrounds and she suddenly asked, oh, how many playgrounds do we have in the municipality? Is it possible to scale this program to all the playgrounds? And uh, so she was calling somebody to find out how many playgrounds she has and then we showed her the maps and we were like, you have 46 playgrounds. So she was surprised that she could access to that information so easily. Uh, what I'm trying to say here for decision makers, for urban planners, having access to information is key. But sometimes uh, I, I think that more key than that is having or being able to analyze that information in different ways. And I think that there are different ways and different methodologies that can help us build better dashboards that can make us m make decisions immediately and, and can help us uh, react to different situations and to different problems in a very positive way. Um, Again, I, I do want to emphasize on data because I, I think this is one of the key things that uh, allows you to make good decisions. 
I'm currently living in the Netherlands. I'm I always surprised of the, the kind of data that you can access in the Netherlands. It's amazing. But it's also uh, unbelievable that even in a country like the Netherlands, that it's a very developed country, you have problems in sharing data from one sector to another sector. So, of course, the data that you have in the health sector is always very isolated data. It's very difficult to access. It's very difficult to... to to have interfaces among different systems that allow you to make a better analysis of data. Um, so I told you at the beginning that uh, I would like to end my presentation just sharing with you if, if, I would have, if I would ever have the possibility to be a mayor or to be a public servant or to be an urban planner and I was able to make a decision on, on some kind of policy or some kind of guideline, uh, I was going through the through the Urban 95 uh, toolkit that we have developed this year, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna choose three ideas that I think can be easily done, that are feasible, and that I would feel I'm, I'm contributing to the, to the development of my city. So the first one would be, I would plant a tree for every baby that's born. This is a real policy that's happening in many different cities around the world. Uh, it's happening in Tirana, it's happening in some cities in the United Kingdom, it's happening in Rotterdam, uh, and I, I wish it would happen in many different cities. I, I think that the symbol of planting a tree and taking care of a tree when a baby is born uh, could make our cities become greener, but could also represent a way of seeing life and seeing public space differently. Um, the other idea I chose from our Urban 95 kit tool that I think it's pretty feasible and that I think um, we, we, can, we should support more and more also because I'm, I'm the kind of person and as a woman I believe that women do need to be part of the workforce and I do feel that the care has to be divided between men and women. So I, I do think that for me one of my priority would be to promote um, parents with good quality and affordable services and support, meaning different kinds of services for different kinds of families, considering the diversity of the society, considering the diversity of needs that families and parents and caregivers might have. Uh, but for me, this is definitely one of the priorities that we should continue to support. And this is definitely one of the priorities that many municipalities keep doing. <coughs> Um, and this is another key idea that, uh, of course, I, I would be promoting and uh, I, I think that every city I've been to has way more cars than we need and, of course, this is affecting the kind of air that we are basically breathing and uh, there's also a lot of evidence that the, the pollution of air has a, a, a broader affection for young kids. Uh, so remember the babies are developing their lungs. So I, I think it's uh, in London. I was in London last week and I was, uh, I was surprised to hear that they might be declaring the first uh, death of a baby uh, caused by uh, air pollution. Um, of course, it has, this has never been uh, a case for any death around the world. We never blame air pollution as the cause for death of anyone. But if you see the reports of WHO, there, there are lots of deaths that are related to air pollution. And, and I personally believe that this might become a big problem. It's already a big problem in, in many cities around the world, but I, I think it, it will become uh, a broader problem in the future. So I think that we need to start doing something now to avoid some of the problems we'll have in the future. And, I, I, I, and also because I think this might become one of the main causes for inequity. So people who would have access to clear and clean air would be like very privileged people and this would be a, another cause to center air pollution and quality of air in very poor societies and very poor contexts. So if, if you ask me from a social policy point of view, for me this would be one of the main policies I would be promoting. Um, just to end here, I, I wanted to share with you some of the publications that have been published recently that focus on uh, young children and I, and I think that if you're curious about learning more about this topic, I would highly recommend to read any of these uh, publications. The first one was published by Arab and it's uh, Cities Alive. It has to do a lot on how you can make public space um, a live public space and uh, I, I think it gives a, a bunch of different examples of some good practices. 
Uh, the second one was uh, published by Gale Institute, and it's also a space to grow that's basically addressing how can you make a friendly, uh, uh, how can you make the most of public space and friendly spaces for families and young children. And the third one is our Urban 95 uh, toolkit, which was recently published, also sharing some of the uh, ideas that we've learned since we started implementing our Urban 95 uh, program. And finally, I would want to make this question back to you, and it's uh, if you could experience the city from 95 centimeters, the height of a healthy three-year-old child, what would you change? And I would like to close my uh, speech just uh, asking you this question so you can go back home and just reflect on this question and think about other amazing ideas that we can still learn about. Thank you very much.